Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Marcy Shore, an associate professor of history at Yale. She researches and teaches European cultural and intellectual history and is the award-winning author of Caviar and Ashes and The Taste of Ashes. Today, we'll talk with Professor Shore about her latest book, The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate History of Revolution. Welcome, Professor Shore. Oh, thank you for having me. So it's lovely to have you back. I remember a few years ago um, you were on talking about, I think it was your first book, The Taste of Ashes. My second the book. The second book, yes. So that was um, very interesting. And now we're going to talk about your newest book. So let's uh, give us an overview of it. Okay. Um, my newest book, or most recent book, um, The Ukrainian Night, is a book about the Ukrainian Revolution on the Maidan that happened in 2013 and 2014. Um, and the, the short version of a long and complicated story about that revolution is that in Ukraine is a post-Soviet country. Mm -hmm. It gains its independence in 1991. Um, there is followed a kind of rough post-Soviet, highly corrupt, oligarchical transition. Mm -hmm. In 2004, there is a presidential election between Viktor Yanukovych, who is somewhat kind of the gangster type um, president, closely aligned with, with Russia, and Viktor Yushchenko, who seems to be looking towards Europe. Um, as a result of both election fraud and an attempt to poison Yushchenko with dioxin, Yanukovych is declared the winner. At that point, people go onto the streets. For three weeks, they go on to the big main square in the center of Kiev called the Maidan, and they protest and they demand free elections. And somewhat miraculously, they are successful with no violence, with no mm -hmm. fighting. The elections are held again. This time, Yushchenko is declared the winner. Um, everybody is happy and goes home. It seems that Viktor Yanukovych can never come back. But then what happens, for a short version of a long story, is that Yushchenko turns out to be a disappointment, perhaps for overdetermined reasons. Um, Yanukovych, whom everybody thought could not possibly come back, hires um, a public relations specialist, a fancy public relations specialist from Washington, who has a little boutique industry doing public relations for gangster types with presidential ambitions. Um, so this man, whose name, as it turns out, is Paul Manafort, goes mm -hmm. over to Kiev, not knowing Russian, not knowing Ukrainian, and gives Yanukovych a makeover. Um, in my opinion, it wasn't terribly effective. He still struck me as a gangster, but he comes back this time legitimately to win the 2010 elections okay. in Ukraine. Um, and at that point, there is a feeling of resignation but there's also a feeling that despite everything, at the very least, Yanukovych is nominally leading Ukraine towards eventual European Union integration. In 2013, he was due to sign an association agreement on behalf of Ukraine with the European Union. Hmm. Now, it was not a fantastic agreement. Um, it would have involved Ukraine undertaking costly reforms it likely would have provoked retaliation from Russia. And at the end of the day, it promised no eventual membership in the European Union. Nonetheless, it was a foot in the door. It was a step in that direction. It was a sign that Ukraine was moving towards the West, was moving towards Europe, was moving outside of its Soviet legacy. Um, and then suddenly, at the 11th hour, when the signing ceremony in Vilnius was already prepared, on November 21st, 2013, Yanukovych suddenly says he's not going to sign it. And at that point, there's, there's shock and a sense of despair, especially among young people and especially among students who had the most to lose. Mm -hmm. They were the ones for whom the question of whether or not Europe was open to them meant the most. Would they be able to study abroad? Would they learn languages? You know, would they be eligible for internships in the mm -hmm. European Union? Would they be able to go to conferences and to meetings without you know, lengthy, expensive, humiliating visa application processes? Um, and the students were the ones you know, who were the most upset, I think, arguably, on November 21st. Still, nothing might have happened had not this 32-year-old Afghan-Ukrainian journalist named Mustafa Nayim posted on Facebook that day 
a short little message in Russian that said, hey guys, um, you know, let's be serious. You know, if you're really upset, come out to the Maidan by midnight tonight, the big square in the center of Kiev. And then he said, likes do not count. Um, interestingly, that's a sentence that would have made no sense before Facebook. Likes do not count. It would have been meaningless. Right. It, it becomes a revolutionary slogan for the 21st century. People come out that night. Um, How many? A couple hundred, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, mostly, but not entirely, students, young people. Um, they held hands, they sang, they had music. The slogan was, Ukraine is Europe. That was it. It was not about language politics. It was not about ethnic politics. It was not about political parties. It was just Ukraine is Europe. We are part of Europe. Um, and they continued to be there kind of night and day um, for the next nine days or so. Mm -hmm. It was very cold. It was late November, Kiev. It's far in the north. Um, but it still had a kind of friendly, you know, quasi-carnivalesque atmosphere, mm -hmm. young people dancing, music. Um, and that might have all kind of faded away with time as it got colder and colder. But then on the night between November 29th and November 30th, Yanukovych decided to send out his riot police to brutally beat up the students. And that was unprecedented, really, mm -hmm. in, in post-Soviet Ukraine. I mean, there was a sense of an unspoken social contract that the government mm -hmm. didn't use that kind of obvious mass violence against its own citizens. Why did he decide to do that after a significant time had passed and they were already, you know, seemingly peaceful? It's a very interesting question. I suspect, but I can't prove this, mm -hmm. and I certainly have no special access to what was going on in his head, that he was counting on the fact that the parents would pull their kids off the streets. Mm -hmm. If he does something shocking, not so brutal as to kill them, but brutal enough to seriously injure some of them, mm -hmm. that would scare everyone and the parents would pull the kids back okay. off the streets. Um, but that was when the miracle happened. And that was when it was, in fact, that was when I started paying attention. I admittedly hadn't been paying much attention. Um, because suddenly he, he sends out these people, the riot police, four in the morning, the middle of the night. He brutally beats up the students, um, counting on, I think, the parents to pull their kids off the streets. And instead of pulling their kids off the streets, the parents join them there. And a day later, you have close to a million people on the streets of Kiev. Wow. No one had ever seen that many people on the streets of Kiev. I can imagine. So uh, let's backtrack a little bit. Why did he not sign that uh, agreement? That's also unclear. I mean, the presumption is that it was pressure from Putin, mm -hmm. um, either threats or pressure or nobody really knows exactly okay. what was happening in his mind. Some people thought maybe he meant to sign it later. Some people thought he didn't realize the costs were going to be that high. The assumption is that there was some last minute pressure from Putin. But why it came at that moment as opposed to earlier, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. So in, in writing your book, how did you do the research for it? Well, I should say, first of all, it's a book I never planned on writing. Okay. Um, on, in the, on the contrary, in some sense, I specifically plan not <laughs> on not writing it. I specifically plan not on writing about contemporary politics. Okay. I don't work on contemporary politics. Um, moreover, as a historian, I don't trust myself to write in real time. Mm -hmm. If historians have advantages over journalists and social sciences, they all come from retrospect. Right. You know, what allows us to play God with that perspective mm -hmm. is looking back. Yes. Looking back, you can know more than anyone could know in real time. So I never planned to write the book. I was trying not to write the book. Um, I found myself unable to turn away at a certain moment. I felt like in all the quarter century or so, which is my whole adult life, that I had been hanging out in Eastern Europe, this was the most extraordinary thing I had ever seen. Okay. Um, and I, I realized that. I realized that this was not just a political protest. This was an existential transformation. It was the return of metaphysics. You know, it was a fundamental kind of break in time mm -hmm. that new human beings were being forged out there. And I also saw, and, and this is something I, I understood, not because I'm smarter than other people, but I was in Vienna at the time. I was at a research institute that had been, 
created in the early 80s as a meeting place for East European and West European intellectuals. I had several close colleagues from Ukraine who were back and forth to Vienna all that year. Um, I knew people who were out there. It was that contiguity. It was that closeness. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I was more perceptive than other people. It was that I was, I was closer to people who were there. And I also saw that it was not understood. It wasn't understood in the American press. It wasn't understood in the German press. It wasn't understood in the Austrian press. There was a sense that something extraordinary was happening, that my Ukrainian friends and colleagues were enormously frustrated that they were not being taken seriously and they could not convey this. Mm -hmm. um, the Poles understood. Uh, you know, and, and one of the things that startled me was comparing the Polish press with the German press. Because in, in Poland, it was somehow understood intuitively, mm -hmm. you know, and in Germany and Austria, it wasn't. And that's when I thought, well, maybe I could play a small role as kind of the cultural mediator in okay. the situation. Like the American Slavicist, who was in the very strange position of, you know, sitting in Vienna and watching the Maidan through Polish eyes in a certain sense. And I thought, maybe I could play a small role and give it a human face, mm -hmm. not kind of not intervene with political analysis, not tell people what they should do or what the policy should be or who should put sanctions on whom, but just try to give it a human face. Okay. So how did you do that? Well, initially I decided that I would try to write a portrait of an individual. You know, I'm, I say I don't work on contemporary politics and I don't even work specifically on political history. I work on intellectual history and the history of ideas. So I thought, well, the one thing, you know, I, you know, I know something about perhaps is writing about intellectuals and revolution, mm -hmm. how they reflect on it, how they process it, you know, how they philosophically work themselves towards it. And I thought, well, if I could write a portrait of a person, you know, and just try to explain what pushes people to make choices, what pushes someone to make choices that a few months ago he or she could not have conceived of himself making. Right. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll focus on one person and I'll try to make it very granular, you know, and very intimate and very human. Why does somebody who has so much to lose decide to, to risk their life in this way? Um, and so I, uh, one of the reasons I thought about doing a portrait of an intellectual is not because I think intellectuals are more important than other people, but intellectuals have the convenient um, and, and very helpful characteristic that they write. Mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I had two little kids at the time. I was still breastfeeding my daughter. I thought, I can't take them to this country in the middle of a revolution. I also can't leave them for very long without me. I had never let, left both of them overnight right. before. I thought, I, I, I can go over quickly. I can stay for a day or two or maybe three and do some long interviews. But what I really need is somebody with a written record who will give me some diachronic depth. Mm -hmm. You know, I need somebody who has been publishing for long enough that I have more sources sure. to work with. And so I strategically then um, selected uh, a translator, uh, essayist, and, and psychoanalyst named Yurko Prohasko, who's brilliant and wonderful. Um, also because I, I, I knew him very vaguely. We, we kind of moved in the same circles, but I hadn't known him well before. Um, he, he grew up kind of trilingual in Ukrainian, his, his native language, Russian and Polish. Uh, I don't speak Ukrainian. I understand a lot, but I don't speak it per se. My Russian was rusty, um, but Polish was a language I used almost every day. And I knew that Yurko had basically native Polish. So I thought, okay, I can go over there. I don't need any like warm up time, mm -hmm. you know, and I can talk to him right away and I'll be able to understand everything right away. Right. Um, and he was a writer who, whose voice I had long I had long admired, who I felt connected to, who I thought I could, I could see how I could use different things he had published in different languages and pull them together in a portrait. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there are others though, too. Yes, well what happened was that I, you know, I, so I went over to Lviv, I talked to Yurko, and then a, a friend of mine said, you know, this revolution really began with the students. You know, they were there first. Um, Yurko's nephew, who is a young journalism student, and, all, and the son of Yurko's brother, who is a very well-known novelist in Ukraine, he was one of the student leaders from the beginning. You should talk to him while you were there. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Yurko. I then talked to Markian, his nephew, 
Um, and then, of course, once I talked to Markion, there was a temptation to talk to Markion's father. Um, and then while I was in Lviv, you know, another friend said, oh, you know what, there's a woman you would love to be. She's, you know, she's a middle-aged real estate agent. She had never been particularly politically active. She's the one who ended up organizing all the buses that transported people from Lviv to Kiev mm -hmm. um, to take part in the revolution. And so my friend Allstop takes me over to see this real estate agent. And as soon as I started to interview her, I could already, as she was talking, I could see how she would work as a kind of literary character. Mm -hmm. I could already, she was showing me these little notebooks that were like those children's notebooks on on graph paper with the little mm -hmm. squares yes. instead of the lines with the tacky pictures of like Levi's and you know, flowers on top, these kind of little notebooks that they sell all over Europe for school kids. Um, and in that notebook, the people who came to get on the buses and to donate money to send other people to the Maidan were like, they were handwritten with mm -hmm. like the name of the person, you know, and the amount of money they were donating to keep the records. And she's showing me these little notebooks with the tacky pictures of the jeans and the coffee and the graph paper. And then she was explaining, you know, what it meant to somehow become a revolutionary organizer, you know, having, you know, spent her life as, you know, a, as a kind of real estate, you know, middle rank real estate mm -hmm. agent in, in a small city. Um, so when you're talking to these people, what was the driving motivator for them? to participate mm -hmm. in the revolution. It may have varied, I imagine, um, or maybe not. This was, the, this was the interesting question for me, and this is where I think that moment of when the students got beaten up turned. Because before that, it was all about getting Ukraine into Europe. After that, and they called, the students called that protest movement Euromaidan. After December 1st, it was just Maidan, and it was no longer just about the European Union. Mm -hmm. Now it was really a revolt, you know, against something that in Russian is called prizvol, and it's an almost untranslatable word that means arbitrariness kind of with a tinge of tyranny, mm -hmm. the sense that you are a helpless plaything at the hands of the powers that be, right. that you are being treated as an object and not a subject, as a thing and not as a human being. You know, and after December 1st, the Maidan was really about asserting human dignity and human subjectivity against the sense that we are being treated you know, as things, mm -hmm. you know, as playthings to be disposed of at the whim of the powers that be. You know, and it was that like, deep revolt against the assault on human dignity right. that philosophically captured me. Mm -hmm. so what ended up happening with the revolution? How did it end? Mm. It ended in a very bloody way. Um, it, it progressed over time. Um, by the beginning of December, it was no longer just a protest movement. It was a whole parallel polis. It was a whole parallel society. So the Maidan, which is I mean, one of the things that's significant about it, is that it, it's a city square in the center of a big city. It's an unusually large square, which played a role, and also a, a, an architecturally complex space that was kind of on different levels mm -hmm. um, in, in various different kinds of configurations. They created a whole parallel world there. Uh, there were people living in tents, there were medical clinics, there were open universities, film screenings, whole kitchens. Um, you know, people were, you know, making tea, people were making food, there was clothing distribution, people were living on the Maidan. Okay. Um, and there was a whole parallel world there. In a sense, a whole parallel world that was functioning according to the values that people wanted to see brought forth in their own society, which were not. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly you had this coming together of people who never would have encountered one another in, in real life. You know, my, my friend Slavko Herzog said it was like a Noah's Ark. Uh -huh. you, know, you had two of every kind. You had parents and children and workers and intellectuals and people on the right and people on the left and people from the countryside and people from the city and people who normally never would have found themselves in the same place. Mm -hmm. And here they were not just engaging in a protest together, but really living in this alternative world together. Okay. So how did that come to an end? Um, the violence increased. Um, all through the winter, I mean, Yanukovych progressively um, 
used more and more violence. At a certain point in the middle of January, he passed by an illegal show of hands a vote in Parliament, these what were called the dictatorship laws, essentially making it illegal for anyone to gather in any way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, again, he thought by raising the stakes, he would push people to go home. But instead what happened is he raised the stakes so that people felt it was all or nothing. Now anyone could be thrown in prison just for being there. Now everyone knew that nobody was safe until he was gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that most fascinated and terrified me was that in, in the end of no, at the end of November, mid-end of November, nobody was thinking they were going to die there. That was not that was that was not in anybody's head. Right. Something changed those last couple weeks in January. By the end of January, beginning of February, a critical mass of people were willing to die there, and you could feel it, like even from a distance. I mean, you could feel it almost palpably that they had made a decision. Mm -hmm. They were not going to leave, and at a certain point, you were in this kind of paralyzed terror, waiting to see how it would end, and right. it ends with a massacre. Wow, and how many people were lost? Over 100 people um, <laughs> were killed in the end. Mm -hmm. um, the, the then Polish Foreign Minister, um, Radek Sikorski, together initially with the French and the German foreign ministers, came over during the shooting um, and tried to negotiate a ceasefire with Yanukovych, mm -hmm. which was one of the moments I was very interested in. Other prominent Ukrainian figures, including the rock star Slava Varkarchuk, who was in fact at Yale for a semester yeah. in the World Fellows Program, he and some of his colleagues ran over to Parliament to try to persuade the parliamentarians during the massacre to at least symbolically, you know, pass some kind of resolution to stop the shooting. Um, there was eventually a ceasefire negotiated um, with Yanukovych. It was very hard to get any representatives of the Maidan to sign it at a moment when their people were being massacred and by snipers. You know, wow. So there were people firing from buildings. Um, in the end, Radek Sikorsky managed in a kind of extraordinary film clip that you can find on the internet to persuade them essentially drawing on the fact that he was a Pole who came of age during Solidarity. And he said, yeah, in 1981, you know, we overestimated our strength and underestimated the government's strength, and we got martial law and mass detentions of all our leaders. You know, you guys sign this or you're all going to be dead. Mm -hmm. And he believed it, you know, at the time. Um, so eventually they agree. You know, there's a ceasefire, um, although there's a lot, a very strong feeling that the fact that Yanukovych, for any length of time, is going to remain the president when he has all this blood on his hands was intolerable. Um, but it ended up being a moot point because within 24 hours or so, he had fled across the border to Russia. Okay. So were there any consequences, um, or I should say, I'm sure there were consequences. Mm -hmm. What were the consequences for the people who you... Um, talk about in your book? Okay. Um, the consequences were heavy for everyone, I would say including for ourselves in this country, because Yanukovych flees across the border to Russia. That's February 2014. Paul Manafort is out of a job, and we all know what he did next. Mm. Um, within days, um, you know, the Kremlin was illegally annexing Crimea mm -hmm. um, and inciting a war in, in the Donbass, which continues to this day, a completely grotesque war. Um, one of the people who was killed on the Maidan was uh, a, a graduate student, a, a finishing graduate student, young professor named Bogdan Sochanik. Um, I, I didn't know him personally, although he had, he had come to my husband's seminars sometimes in Warsaw, and we knew many people in common. And then I got to know a lot of his friends afterwards, who were the, also the graduate students mm -hmm. of my colleagues in Ukraine. And they very much had this feeling of needing to do something kind of in his memory. Um, there were many people who, who fought, you know, who had post-traumatic stress mm -hmm, for quite a sure. while. I mean, one of the stories I tell in the book, in fact, the stories I open the book with is a, a story of a young man named Misha who was a student at the time, he's a graduate student now, he's a very, and he's, he's very thin, um, a little bit nerdy, very sweet, um, these amazing brown eyes, very, very serious student, you know, from 
a family with no money in which he is the only man. There's a, a grandmother, a single mother, you know, Misha and his, and his much younger sister whom he helped take care of. Um, he had never done anything that involved any kind of fighting before. Mm -hmm. um, and he was out there during the, dur during the shooting. Yeah, you know, and was quite convinced he was going to be killed, but was you know, felt like he had to stay. It was mm -hmm. a moral imperative to stay, and he ended up saving somebody else's life there when he carries this wounded man back together with a friend. And his his mother is calling him, during and pleading with him to come home. And his grandmother is calling him, pleading with him to come home. You know, and he says, "No, I can't. I have to stay." Um, and he he survived. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was very, very hard for him to calm down afterwards. And when I met him, he was still very, very shaky. With those dire consequences, moving forward, and again, this happened 2014, 2015, right? That's 2013, 2014. 2014, okay. So that's really not that long ago at all. So I'm wondering now, moving forward, here we are in um, 2019, almost 2020. <sighs> How, what effect has that revolution had on on Ukraine in terms of, you know, people still remember as a, a very bloody situation, mm -hmm. and I can only imagine it must have a significant effect on the people. I think it changed everybody who went through it in a very profound way. Um, there's been a widespread sense of disappointment that the values that were so strongly expressed and agreed upon have not found expression in the political realm to the extent that mm -hmm. they would like. There's also the sense of it, that they are, it is very difficult to do anything in that country because this grotesque war continues. Right. And it's very hard to even know what the revolution would have been and what the consequences would have been had there not been this war. And the war was really, one of the things I describe in the book is that the Maidan for me was a moment of modernism in the sense of we believe in truth. We believe that there is such thing as a human subject that is real, that sustains an identity, that is endowed with Kantian dignity. We believe that there is such a thing as truth. You know, we believe that there's a distinction between truth and lies. Mm -hmm. That was a kind of modernist moment. You know, when I teach intellectual history, I tell my students that modernity is all about replacing God. Postmodernity is when you give up on replacing God. And that border between modernity and postmodernity happens right at the end of February 2014 when the war in the Donbass begins because it's literally invented. Mm -hmm. I mean, then you have post truth. You know, suddenly you have you know, separatist gangster types. Um, rising up or you know overthrowing governments telling local people that the maidan was a cia sponsored fascist conspiracy and ukrainian nazis with american weapons are now coming to kill all the russian speakers in eastern ukraine um, and nobody even really understood what was going on in the beginning. One of the stories I tell in the second half of the book ends up being largely about the war of the mm -hmm. Donbass, which I hadn't expected. Um, but one of the stories I tell was told to me by a young woman from Donetsk in the Donbass who had been, uh, she was a graduate student in media studies. She was one of the curators of a kind of gallery salon discussion place called Izolatvia. Mm -hmm. Um, and that space was taken over by the separatists when they took over Donetsk. It was turned into a prison. Um, she you know, and her friends ended up leaving. You know, they went to Kiev. And she, the later, maybe a year or so later, several months later, I was sitting with her at this cafe in Kiev, and she was trying to narrate to me exactly what happened when the separatists arrived. Well, there were these guys, and I kind of remembered them from high school. They always had these leanings, and there were those guys, and no one really knew who they were, but they were always kind of hooligans. And then there were, you know, the people coming across the border from Russia and saying they were tourists. And she's like, and then one day, the Chechens appeared, and they didn't even speak Russian very well, and they didn't understand why they were getting Ukrainian hryvna instead of Russian rubles from the bank machines. And then they called this meeting on Lenin Square, and an elderly you know, Orthodox Christian grandmother comes to the meeting on Lenin Square, and she gives an Orthodox christening to the Chechen soldier so that he'll, so he would be victorious in battle against the Ukrainian Nazis. 
And poor Katya sitting there you know, trying to explain this to me in Kiev, like tearing her hair out. And she's saying, you know, Marcy, everything is, everything is fiction in this story. You have the, the Christian grandmother on the communist square giving an orthodox christening to a Muslim soldier so that he can be victorious in battle against non-existent Ukrainian Nazis. Everything is fiction, and it's all really happening to us. Wow. That is a, that's amazing, mm. amazing. So uh, what do you think the future holds for Ukraine at this point? I wish I knew. <laughs> Historians, in the best case, can mm -hmm. tell you what already happened. Yes. Um, we're very, very bad about telling you um, what, what will happen. Yeah. Uh, one thing I can say is that if I understood maybe faster than some of my other American friends and colleagues what was happening here, um, three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, and continues to this day. It's not because I was smarter, but because I understood what was happening in Russia and Ukraine. Right. So are you um, happy you changed your mind and wrote the book? That's a good question. So I, I wrote the essay, um, and I meant it as, again, an intervention, almost a, as a cultural mediator, as a translator, um, as, as somebody who was just trying to kind of help one world understand another world. And I wrote it the summer of 2014. It ended up being longer than I had intended. Um, I, I published it in German, which in some sense was my target audience because I was living in Vienna and I was surrounded by the German language press. And that was in some sense the press that my Ukrainian friends cared about the most. Mm -hmm. um, Many of them were Germanist by training. You know, many of the leading Ukrainian intellectuals were, were laid lectured in Germany. They translated German literature. But there was also a sense that the EU meant Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, to, that was the sure. audience to whom they were addressing themselves. So the cold reception mm -hmm. from the German-speaking press was particularly painful. America was all the way across the ocean. Of course, we have no culture. We're existentially thin. We're never going to understand anything. But for the Germans not to understand was particularly painful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to be part of this world. Um, and so I, I published it, you know, in, in a very good journal with a wonderful editor in German, um, in a good German translation to the extent that my German's good enough to judge the translation. I wrote it in English. And then I, I was unable to find an editor for it in English. Or I was unable to find anyone who would take it at that length. Mm -hmm. um, it was a moment where people wanted policy analysis and there was no policy analysis. People wanted something that was 3,000 words and I had 15,000 words. and uh, So everyone was saying, well, you have to cut it in two thirds or in half. And I showed it to one editor who was at the time at Yale, Steve Wasserman, who I knew, you know, asking if he could recommend some kind of venue for mm -hmm. it in English. And he read it, and he called me, and he said, Marcy, let's have coffee. Um, and then he said, you know, you shouldn't cut it. You should go back to Ukraine. You should talk to more people, and this should be a short book. And at, at first I said, no, I couldn't possibly do that. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't there when people were shooting. I wasn't there at the right time. I don't speak Ukrainian. Um, I, I don't cover contemporary things. But he kept talking to me about it, uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I found myself irrationally drawn into it, feeling like the thing, for whatever irrational reason mm -hmm. I have to do at the moment, is write this book. Right, right. Well, I'm certainly happy that you did. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here and sharing some of your work. Well, thank you so much for having me. Okay. For more information about Professor Shore and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you.